the Corps of Engineers. Engineers must be oriented and adapted to a multitude of tasks. The Army Corps of Engineers is raising the dam by eight meters. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers lays out their response plan. We provide infrastructure assessment, temporary roofing, temporary emergency power. We help with debris assessment and removal operations. We also work with temporary housing. And he'll tell you there's no end to the types of services the engineers provide. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Building Strong Buffalo podcast. This is the place to get to know the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Buffalo District, our people, and our stories. My name is Jess Levinson, and I'm a public affairs specialist with the district. I'm going to start the podcast by reading a story from the Wall Street Journal that was published recently. It took less than eight hours for wind-whipped waves surging off of record-high Lake Michigan during a recent storm to shorten Charlotte and Rudolph Brangle's backyard by 40 feet. The erosion transformed what had been a grassy slope to the shoreline into a cliff with a 12-foot drop, taking out a lakeside deck and stopping about 10 feet short of the Brangle's septic pipes. Their neighbors fared worse. Water battered the back of that home and washed away the yard. If there's another storm, we're going to be finished, said Miss Brangle. This story is just one example from one shoreline of one great lake. The communities, homes, and business built on the shores of all the Great Lakes are experiencing erosion at increased and alarming rates. Weston Cross is our guest today. He's a coastal geologist with the district, and he knows erosion and coastal geology inside and out. Weston, how are you? I'm doing all right, thanks. How about yourself? Doing really good. Thanks for coming in today. This is our very first in-person, in-studio podcast episode, and I'm really glad to have you. Oh, fantastic. Glad I could be the guinea pig. (laughs) So uh, let's just start a bit with uh, what's been going on recently. Uh, What have you been working on? Well, we are still amazingly busy on the design side, as you kind of pointed out in your intro. The uh, the erosion never sleeps. The the structures don't get any younger. So we uh, we've had a continual design effort rolling through. Uh, We got repair designs out there for a number of our structures in our harbors. Uh, We have design and evaluation going on for a number of uh, sediment reuse projects throughout Ohio. Uh, We've got uh, we're we're busy. Uh, Things are rolling. And I know you, before we started the podcast, you were talking about a Presque Isle project, uh, which is relevant for a lot of uh, people in Pennsylvania. It brings in a lot of tourism money. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Presque Isle is one of the the jewels of the Lower Great Lakes, gorgeous six and a half mile long sand spit extending onto Lake Erie. Uh, The Corps' involvement with that project goes back well over 100 years. Um, That peninsula and that neck has been suffering erosion and damage uh, going back to the 1800s. We've had an extensive established nourishment program at that project since the mid-60s or so. Uh, That was before the construction of the breakwaters. We were just, the Corps was out there putting 167,000 cubic yards of sand every single year onto that shoreline to try and maintain those beaches, uh, maintain that ecosystem and that protection to Erie Harbor. Um, we built the breakwaters there from 90 to 93 to reduce that amount of overall sand to put in there uh, and establish a more sustainable beach. Um, this year, however, with the continued uh, record high lake levels on Lake Erie especially, I think we had three monthly record levels set in 2019, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was February, March, and April of 2020, have also set all-time record high lake levels on Lake Erie. Uh, with that, we've seen erosion that we've not seen on that project in 30 plus, 40 plus years since the construction of those breakwaters. Uh, so it presented a special challenge to us this year because we're we're normally placing about 38,000 cubic yards of sand per year. Uh, we've almost doubled that since the levels came up in 2015. We've been doing closer to 60 to 70,000 cubic yards over the past few years. Uh, and this year's design, it just there was there was so much need down there. We had to we had to spend a pretty good amount of time, uh, more so than we normally do, on design elements and figuring out sand quantities, and then working with the funding and uh, park availability to ensure we could actually put that sand out there. Nice. Like I said, this guy knows his stuff. So, how long have you lived in this area and by the Great Lakes? Well, I grew up in central New York, uh, around the Finger Lakes. Grew up most of the summer spent swimming and boating on one of the smaller Finger Lakes. Uh, didn't really get involved with the Great Lakes uh, until starting with the Corps back, what, about 12 years ago or so. I uh, moved to Buffalo 20 years ago and knew of Erie and Ontario, but didn't get heavily involved. Um, started here with the Coastal Engineering Branch, got to work under some fantastic uh, and very passionate senior engineers and sort of was able to work off of their passion 
Um, and that's, that's really kind of molded how I've gone forward in my career. So that brings me to uh, kind of a general question. I think a lot of what we do in the Corps of Engineers is working with and against Mother Nature. And I'm wondering if you agree with that. Well, the very nature of design and working with uh, a natural system is that you're never going purely in either one of those directions. I mean, it, there, there's always a limit to how much you can work with Mother Nature gives you and also trying to meet your overall project goals. You also can't purely work against Mother Nature because she's, she's going to humble you in a hurry. Um, so we, we are, you know, at the basis of all of this is understanding the, the background processes and looking to the past to inform what's going to happen as we go forward. So we spend a lot of time uh, doing evaluations of uh, historic shorelines, uh, historic sediment transport, and trying to use that to really inform what we have going on there. Um, we, you know, we do have to go into some areas and draw the proverbial line in the sand if we've got some critical infrastructure or something we've got to protect. But even then, you are spending a great deal of time trying to understand what what the lake's impacts on your proposed design are going to be. And then on the flip side of that, what the impacts of your design are going to be on the lakeshore in that area. Um, you, in some areas, unfortunately, you just have to harden the shoreline. But understanding what that hardening is going to do uh, is, is the key to shoreline management. Um, we've got our two big projects that I think are great evidence of working with Mother Nature or the Presque Isle project we already talked about. Uh, the goal of that project was not to stop erosion. The goal of that project was not to stop sand transport. It was to try and slow down the sand transport as it moves through the park, slow down the erosion, but still allow that sand to transport through, recognizing that um, it needs to get out to go point out to the distal end to support that environment and ecology out there. Uh, the other project recently constructed in the last few years was uh, Braddock Bay, the ecosystem restoration up on Lake Ontario. Uh, historically, Braddock Bay had a, a stable bay mouth bar that allowed for these two separate, you had your open lake ecosystem, and then you had this spawning area and great ecology uh, for both bird and fish um, within the bay itself that was protected from the, uh, the lake waves. That project suffered, or that area suffered, with the increased shoreline hardening, people not taking into account the natural processes that hardening or protecting your shoreline were having, that shoreline hardening led to a decrease in the sediment transport through that area. When you decrease that sediment transport, the wave action is going to work on whatever's there. Historically, it had worked on the sediment moving through the system. Now it was working on that established bar, opened that uh, bay up to the lake forces, and turned it into just almost an open lake environment, uh, losing that spawning, that habitat. Uh, we work to understand the natural transport processes past that bay uh, to build a it's a, a spine breakwater with a headland breakwater system so there's a small little kind of protected beach there for bird habitat uh, and that was designed very very carefully to try and match the transport directions going across that bay we were asked very early on in that project if there was a way to do it without using stone without using some sort of hardened structure and unfortunately with the reduced sediment transport through that area there there just wasn't but our hardened structure is very very specifically designed to actually restore that transport past the bay and allow the sediment that's coming into there to continue on to the east rather than getting blown into the bay uh, so far the the observations of that project have have shown that we've met those goals so for me i kind of need to take it back to the fundamentals the definition I know of erosion is the wearing away of the shoreline by forces moving sand and soil from one area to another. Does that sound accurate? That's the Webster Dictionary version. Um, it's, it's a bit deeper than that in that it's not just the act of erosion, it's the, the quantity and speed of the erosion along with what is being eroded. Um, erosion doesn't become a problem until it impacts something on the shoreline. Uh, infrastructure, a road, a house, uh, a wetland, that sort of thing. It, it's Eroding is a natural process. It's going to happen on every coastline in the world. It's just what is that erosion impacting that is truly truly the, uh, the point that makes it notable. Yeah, so right now it is really notable. Normally we're not paying attention to erosion because of some of the reasons that you mentioned, uh, but this podcast is about bringing some awareness to it. Can you talk a little bit more about that erosion can be good, that it's a natural process, and how it helps uh, the ecosystem and what it does. Well, so along the shoreline, you're, you're, over time, your wave energy and the waves impacting the shoreline remain relatively constant. Yes, water levels go up, that wave energy comes into shore a little bit more, water levels go down, that wave energy, it's still about the same amount of wave energy, it's just further down in the profile. Um, 
what changes over time is what that erosion is acting upon. So you have this this some amount of force that is capable of moving sediments. In a unarmored, fully unarmored natural system, for the most part, you have an abundance of sedi- sediments moving along the shoreline. The wave energy is able to continually act upon that. It's called littoral drift. Littoral drift is constantly moving along every shoreline that receives wave energy. Um, as you armor the shoreline, you you certainly slow the erosion or sometimes completely arrest the erosion in that spot where it's armored. What you've also done is you've arrested that sediment transport into the system. You're re- then reducing the overall sediment transport moving along the shoreline. Again, the wave energy hasn't changed, but it has less natural sediment to work on as it's working as it's reworking sediments and uh, impacting the shoreline. With less sediment, it's now impacting the unarmored shorelines to a greater extent because that energy is still there. It's still got to act upon something. So when you armor, it is a well-proven and accepted coastal fact that that armoring will have negative impacts, what's called down drift or further down the shoreline as that sediment moves down because you've, you've decreased the amount of sediment there to be able to be transported along the shoreline and so that by extension will will increase the erosion in the unarmored areas so we know that erosion is can be arrested or can be um, stopped in one particular place and it might move on to another place but how quickly in general is the lake erie and lake ontario shoreline eroding well it varies greatly um there's there's such a diverse geomorphological um, geomorphological change as you go along Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. You've got Western Lake Erie with the former black swamp sediments. It's all fine grain material, readily eroded. Um, it just, it, it, as soon as wave energy hits it, it starts moving. Um, that, that area of the shoreline has almost entirely been armored because of that heavy erosion of it. It's all, again, it's all silts and clays, has almost no resistance to wave energy. You move just a little bit further to the east, you hit the Marblehead Peninsula. It's all limestone, relatively resistant uh, to erosion. You continue to move through Ohio. You get into more uh, glacial lacustrine bluffs. You get more bedrock cropping out as you get to Cle- the Cleveland area, a bit more shale through Cuyahoga County. Uh, and so you get just v- intensely varied rates of erosion. Um, wherever you give resistant bedrock, you're going to have very low rates of erosion. Wherever you have fine grain materials or beach sediments or that sort of thing, or um, Lake Michigan right now is experience, experiencing big problems because a huge amount of their bluffs consist of dunes. It's just sand, water deposited sand that is very, very erosive. Uh, and so as this, the water levels come up and those wave energies come further inland, they, they have much more power than they would um, on a limestone bluff, let's say, or something along those lines. Like you mentioned, there's an increase of erosion in, in particular areas after man-made prevention methods are also increased uh, along the shoreline. And then that just increases erosion and that increases people's willingness to build more shoreline prevention. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a, a cycle. It's, you, you get further erosion, people armor further, you get less sediment moving through the system causing more erosion, people armor further. And it's, it's really one of the big challenges is trying to recognize where areas of armoring are necessary because either the shoreline is highly erosive and there's not much else you can do or where it won't have much impact if you've got an area that's eroding that isn't contributing much for beach quality materials. Uh, I use Western Lake Erie again as a, a perfect example. It had this very high erosion rate, but it was all these fine grain materials. So as they eroded, those fine grain materials just get swept off into deep water for the most part. They don't contribute much to that littoral system. So if you're armoring areas that is primarily fines, your impacts are going to be much less than, for example, if you're up on Lake Ontario and you're armoring one of the drumlins, which is, you know, it could be 50, 60 meters tall um, and be eroding at a meter a year or more. And it's all just beach quality sands and cobbles and gravel and, and things that are very important to a healthy littoral system. All right, so if I understand the the geology of shoreline varies and that can impact the erosion levels on them. But what I also understand about <clears throat> what I also understand about erosion is that the structures that are built to prevent it have varying levels of um, effect on the erosion as well. So what factors should be considered when an individual thinks about building a shoreline protection project for their home, for communities along the Great Lakes, 
and also for the Corps of Engineers uh, when we build our shoreline protection projects. Well, to, to start with what's kind of classically considered a fully armored structure, there's, there's two basic types of that, and there's two kind of separate goals of them. Um, the, the, the first being a groin. It's a, a structure that historically is made out of sheet piles, sometimes rocks, sometimes concrete, but it just sticks straight out of the lake. And the goal there isn't necessarily to stop erosion at that point. The goal of that structure, I mean, it, and it does somewhat stop erosion because the goal of that structure is to actually trap sand within it. So it's, it's taking the littoral material that comes in and it's trying to hold that littoral material there. So you are arresting uh, erosion at that spot by virtue of having that buffer of sand now in front of, you know, whatever you're trying to protect. But those are in, incredibly harmful as you move down drift because by blocking that, that sand transport, you've almost completely cut off your neighbor down the way uh, and they're going to see increased erosion from that. So that's the groin with the, the, you know, trying to stop the movement along the shore. The other flip side of that is the, you know, the hardened shoreline going along the shore which isn't necessarily trying to trap material. It's still trying to let material go forward, but it's trying to arrest the actual erosion of that bluff. So you're no longer, the, the negative impact to that structure is that that sediment that was entering the littoral system now is cut off from the littoral system. So you're, you're reducing the total sand supply moving down the beach. So those are your kind of, your two hardened. And those, you know, the, the revetment, shore attached type structures they can be in the form of a seawall they can be in the form of a you know rubble mound armor structure um, there, there's a, a number of different ways to go about that that have their own pros and cons uh, as you move towards you know more green types of um, structures where you're trying to you're not trying to fully arrest the erosion you're trying to slow it down manage it a little bit but still allow that shoreline to interact with the lake those are obviously much less harmful to the natural system and the erosion outside of your project area than than one of the you know the shore attached revetment or the the groin. Is there ever a reason to want to arrest erosion immediately? Because it sounds like slowing it down is a more holistic approach. Holistic is a great word, and it, it's it's an ideal approach is to slow it down but still allow that shoreline to interact with the the water, but. It, it's entirely dependent on what is on that shoreline. Um, and in some areas, there's critical infrastructure. In some areas, there's things that must be protected. And we, we go in there and we have to fully armor them. I mean, um, Athol Springs, the project we have going on south of Buffalo right now, that's a shore-attached revetment. Now, it's in front of a concrete wall that's been there for 90 years, 80 years, however long. It's been there for longer than in our lifetimes. Um, but we are building a rubble mound revetment in front of that because it's a major state highway running right through there. It's a shoreline that was already hardened. So by adding just another layer of protection in front of it, we're not having any negative impacts on the littoral transport system that weren't already there. And genuinely it's, it's infeasible to go in there and say, we're going to tear down the wall, the, the, you know, the seawall that's there, and we're going to allow this to naturally erode back into where is presently a state highway that would require relocation of the state highway, it would eventually impact St. Francis. So yes, there, there is absolutely, um, depending on what you're needing to protect and the, the economics of it and everything, there's absolutely a reason to, to go in there and, and put in your hardened structure and, and try and keep it where it is. Got it. Another factor that I'd like to hear thoughts on is when is the best time to build a coastal resiliency or shoreline protection project? Um, like what season I know you know, waves can get really bad uh, in the wintertime and erosion as well? From uh, impacts on the shoreline transport system, uh, it's, it, you're not going to make much of a difference if you're building in April versus June versus August. I mean, you do get the, the water levels do come up a bit during the summer just naturally. And during the summer, you also get a slightly calmer sea state. Uh, so nourishment and that sort of thing is going to be more effective if you're placing it in the May, June, July time frame because the, the sediment transport along the shoreline, it's partly a function of um, the wave steepness as well as the wave energy. So you get sh basically shallower waves during the summer that they will, they will erode the shoreline and have more they, – they tend to keep that sediment closer to the shore as it moves along. You get your steeper winter waves, your, you know, your no November storms and everything else. Um, and in through March and everything, it's a steeper wave that comes down more forcefully on the beach and actually will take more of the littoral sediment and move it off 
Sure, but that that's that really not related much to coastal protection. More so if you're doing a pure sediment nourishment or pre-nourishment type of project, um, it, it's going to be more a uh, construction considerations at that point. You know, it's what's what's going to be easiest for your folks to work. You don't you don't want to be out there, you know, around Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, trying to to build a coastal structure. Um, you're just going to be at much higher risk for damage to your uncompleted work, uh, much higher risk of damage to your equipment, that sort of thing. With all of these factors that go into considering what makes the best or most appropriate shoreline protection project, how can we start thinking of shoreline protection as a system-wide approach now that we also know that one protection project could impact the shoreline farther down? We in the Corps have been uh, working on that for long since before I joined. Um, we have, especially on Lakes Erie and Ontario, we have very detailed sediment budget projects we've worked on. We've received great support through the Regional Sediment Management Program through ERDIC and headquarters. Uh, we've done extensive measurements uh, going back to you know Lake Erie. We have erosion rates, rough erosion rates going back to the 1860s um, that we break it up by periods of development. Uh, so we have, I mean, it, it's a planning tool. It's not a... When you go to design a, a shoreline structure, you need to be doing your own measurements and everything on your particular section of shore. But in one kilometer reaches along both Lake Erie and Ontario, um, Lake Erie from Toledo pretty much all the way up to Buffalo, Ontario from the Niagara River to uh, a little past the Oswego, we have estimates of erosion rates for each of those shorelines. We also have estimates of the geology of that shoreline, how much each portion of that shoreline is contributing through this erosion into the littoral system. Uh, so we, we, we've we rolled these tools out. They're publicly available. Uh, to, you know, there's, a, there's a web map. Just do a Google search for uh, Lake Erie and Ontario sediment budget. It'll bring you right to it. Um, so we're, we're, again, referring to this primarily as a planning level tool. If you've got a section of shoreline that's eroding, we have the ability now to take a look through this tool, look through these data sets we have, and start to quantify what the impacts of that shoreline a shoreline um, armoring are going to be. Are you armoring a shoreline that is eroding at a very slow rate, that is a very low bluff, um, that isn't contributing much sediment to the system? Then that's it's probably okay to go with a, a slightly harder or you know more more robust section of shoreline armoring that's going to further cut the bluff line from the water in that interaction. If you're in an area where you've got erosion of a couple meters a year, but you've got a high bluff that's really good littoral sediments, that, that the erosion of that bluff, yes, it's it's a problem for that piece of land or whatever is on it. But it, it by by putting in a fully armored shoreline in front of that, we're now trying to consider what that does. So if in that in that area of high bluff, you armor that, you're now cutting off a significant amount of sediment that used to go into the the uh, littoral transport system that now no longer is. So you've cut down that transport volume going down the shore. Uh, and so these, these Lake Erie and Lake Ontario sediment budget tools have been, I mean, they've been big projects uh, to get done. Um, in some instances, it's been over 10 years of, of work to get to the point we're at as far as data analysis and everything else. But they've already proven in the, the year and a half, two years since we've rolled them out, they've proven to be hugely beneficial to understanding exactly what you're talking about and trying to really get a more system-wide approach. Uh, so I heard you mention a few times how important data is to what we do, um, and also the fact that, in a certain sense, people have been collecting data on erosion since 1860. I'm curious how you've seen, as someone who studies this and lives it every day, how data has changed over the time, how people collect the data, and how we've used it into understanding the world around us and how we solve the problems that we need to well, we've been i mean the obviously data collection methods are evolving incredibly quickly uh, i mentioned on the lake erie project we've got erosion estimates going back to the 1860s well in 18 the 1860s data we're relying on it's hand-drawn navigation charts either from noaa or from our internal files so there's obviously a decent bit of error in that by the time we get to the 1930s we have the advent of aerial photography so we're taking our measurements by trying to discern the, either the bluff line or the line of significance in that photo um, we get more, you know, the 1970s was our next time frame. Again, we were still mostly reliant on aerial photos. Some additional charting that NOAA had and everything else started to become out more online. Uh, and then since 2000, 2002, with the, with the, you know, the evolving of LIDAR and remote sensing-based data collection methods, we have just a treasure trove of data now, uh, this elevation data that we can down to 
you know, most time we're working about a one meter grid, but we can have an elevation point for every square meter along the shoreline. And we can redo those data collections year after year and decade after decade. And so that gives you an even better set of data to evolve. You can just lay one surface over the other and see exactly where the, where the changes have been, where your erosion rates are, how much material that actually is. Um, and so we're, we're constantly adjusting our evaluation methods to work with the data as best we can. Um, and it's as the data sets change, as the data sets become more involved, it, it just gives you this, this amazing ability to process things. That's amazing. Data is the future and we're using it the best we can. All right, Weston, our last question of the podcast is, how do we want people to start thinking about this issue uh, differently or just become more aware of a particular way of thinking? I think anybody involved with living near or interacting with the shoreline is, is acutely aware of the erosion issues, especially given the high water levels we have right now. Um, but the, the need to really think about it, not just as, as what's going on in the piece of land or shoreline that you're looking at, but both updrift and downdrift of where you are and getting more to the systems wide approach. Uh, we've, we've had a huge push to that, not just within the core, but within the, the coastal community uh, with our interactions with the state of Ohio and the state of New York and the state of Pennsylvania. Um, there's much more recognition today of the, the actual impacts of what we're building and what we're trying to do to the shoreline uh, and really trying to, to understand that before we make massive modifications or, or plans for what we're gonna build there. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Really appreciate it. Glad to be here. It was a lot of fun.